right, so we're going to start going over the study guide for seventh grade, the seventh grade CQA for quarter one. Our first question is identifying if it, a number is rational or irrational. Our first number is a repeating decimal, and repeating decimals are rational because you know what is coming next. All right, the second number is like actually a symbol. What symbol is this for? Pi. How do you spell pi? Just a P. Whoa, sorry. It wasn't on my pen. A P I. You can remember it ends in an I, and irrational starts with an I. Pi is always irrational. I and I. Because it's a decimal that doesn't stop and doesn't repeat. The second number is the square root of 7. Is this a perfect square or not a perfect square? Not a perfect square. If you put the square root of 7 in a calculator, you would get a decimal that doesn't stop and doesn't repeat, just like pi. So this is also irrational. So not perfect. So I. On your test tomorrow, you're not going to have to say why. Okay, I'm kind of giving a reason why. You don't have to say why, but I want you... I mean, this is your study guide, so this is kind of like taking notes. And we have talked about these this year, but still, this is a reminder of why. All right, the fourth number is a negative fraction. All fractions are rational. So all fractions, rational. So it doesn't matter that it's negative, negative one-third, rational. Positive one-third would be rational. And the last number is the square root of 49. So here we have another square root. Now, square root of 7 was not perfect, but is the square root of 49 perfect? What does it equal? 7. So it is rational. So again, it is perfect. So it makes it rational. All right, are there any questions about any of these five numbers and why it is rational or irrational? Tommy. Tommy. Okay, so sometimes if it keeps continuing, it's irrational, but that's when it doesn't repeat. If it does repeat, you know what's coming next. After this one would be an 8, and then another one, and then an 8, and another one. So rational, the definition of rational, like in language arts class, is something that makes sense. So it's making sense. You know what's going to happen. These other numbers, you don't know what's going to happen. Addison? So that is a common mistake on these ones that are not perfect, is thinking about two numbers that you add together to get that, and that can happen. So try to remember on these square roots that it's a number times itself. 7 times 7 would be 49. There's nothing times itself that you could get, do to get 7. Again, if you put it into a calculator, which we're not going to be able to do on the CQA, but if you did, it would be a decimal that didn't stop or repeat. It would be 2.5. Eight, seven, something, who knows? Two point something. All right, let's look at number two. So on number two, you're comparing using greater than, less than, or equal to. You're comparing a square root to a whole number. So when before you do this, don't just look at the 64 and the 20. It's important that there is a square root symbol, also called a, what's that square root symbol called? Radical sign. It's called a radical sign. Radical. I don't know why, but that's what it is. What is the square root of 64? 8. eight. So you're really comparing an 8 to a 20, and 8 is less than 20. So the alligator is eating the bigger number. Now, if they give you the option of this, if there's like four multiple choice and one of your options is this, do you know what that means? It means about. If you're comparing, do not ever choose that one. They're putting that in there to confuse you. If you're comparing, you need to be using one of those three symbols. Do not choose about. Okay? So, no. What is what? It means about. Okay? So, this means equal exactly. That means about. Like if you're estimating or something. Like when we talk about pi, pi is about 3.14. Because it really is much longer. There's much more to it. But this is like the rounded answer. All right, number three, we're ordering the numbers from least to greatest. So we're talking about numbers that are the smallest, 
and we have positive and negative numbers, we can automatically say that the negative numbers are going to be the smallest, right? How many negative numbers do I have up here? Two or three? Uh, okay, this is not negative, is it? We'll talk about that in a second. So these are your two negative numbers. Negative numbers are always going to be smaller than positive numbers. Now, let's turn 7 over 2 into a decimal. How many times will 2 go into 7? Three times with how many left over? Well, you'd have one left over, right? So we could write that as negative 3.5. And the other one is negative 3.75. So we got to think about which one is smaller. Be very careful when you're thinking about negatives. The bigger the digits, when it's negative, the smaller it actually is, right? So if we added a zero to this to make it a little bit easier to compare them, negative 3.75 is the smallest. And then your negative, this one, which was negative 7 over 2. All right, let's talk about our positive numbers now. So we have the pi symbol, and again, pi is what? 3.14. Do you know what absolute value means, like the definition of absolute value? Very good. The distance the number is away from zero on a number line. So negative five is how many places away from zero? Five. Absolute value is always positive. We'll say that again. Absolute value is always positive. And then we have 4.25. So 3.14, 5, and 4.25. Which one of those three is the smallest? Think about money, $3.14, $5, or $4.25. Which is the smallest? Pi, the 3.14. So we're going to do a pi symbol. Now what? $5 or $4.25? $4.25. And then the absolute value of negative 5 is the largest number on here. So you're going to be doing these tomorrow on Edge Elastic and like dragging and dropping them. But then I'm going to also give you an answer sheet where you'd write it out like this. Okay. But again, I do want you to practice doing those things on Edge Elastic because it'll help you practice using those um, tech tools. All right, let's look at number four. So number four says select all, that means usually more than one, all of the expressions that are equivalent to a negative and then a one-third in parentheses. So give me one of them that you think would be equivalent. Tommy. Negative one over three. I agree. Is there any others? One over negative three. I agree. Any others? Two negatives make a Two negatives make it negative. No. When you're dividing, this is fractions are division problems. So this is like saying negative one divided by negative three, which would make a positive. Okay? So two negatives make a positive. So this would really turn into a positive one third, which is different. So the only two choices you have here are the first two. Okay? first two. So when you're writing a fraction, let's say we have the fraction negative two-fifths. Negative two-fifths. You could say negative out front, two-fifths. You could say negative two-fifths. Or you could say two over negative five. Those are all the same thing. So again, out front, up top, or down below. But you cannot have it on top and bottom because again, two negatives make a positive. Any questions on that one? Okay, number five. Which expression is equivalent to that? Now, what type of problem is this? There's a property here that we're using. Starts with a D. Distributive property. Again, distributive property. And in the distributive property, you're distributing or multiplying the number that's on the outside of the parentheses 
by the numbers that are inside the parentheses. So we're going to say negative 7 times 2 fifths, and we also have to distribute it to the 1 third. If you look at B, B it only shows that you're doing negative 7 times 2 fifths. It doesn't show that you're doing negative 7 times 1 third. So it can't be B. Now the other thing that I want you to notice is inside of these parentheses, there is a plus sign right there. So looking at A, C, and D, we have a plus sign. We have a plus sign. Is there a plus sign in C? No, so it's definitely not C either. Now what is the difference between A and D? Again, you're doing negative 7 times 2 fifths and a negative 7 times 1 third. And then you're putting this plus sign down here. So in D, negative 7 times 2 fifths, but this is a 7. Okay, so that's not going to work. It's A. Negative 7 times 2 fifths and negative 7 times 1 third. And then you put that plus sign in between them. You don't have to solve it, don't worry. Again, negative 7 times 2 fifths and a negative 7 times 1 third, and that plus sign is in between them. Down here in D, you do not have a negative sign in front of that 7. Okay? So I think this looks like a confusing problem just because of the negatives and the fractions and the parentheses, but don't make it harder than it needs to be. All right, number six, <clears throat> simplify the expression, part A, select the best first step using the additive inverse. We'll talk about that in a second. That's going to be worth one point. And then part B, finish simplifying the expression. That'll be worth a second point. Okay, so this question's worth two points. So additive inverse, do you have any idea what they mean by additive inverse? When we're solving equations, we're doing inverse operations. What does that mean? Very good. Opposite. So looking at this problem, do you see anything that are opposites, Tommy? All right, so this one, two-fifths, and then a negative two-fifths, those are opposites. So if I was going to simplify this problem, opposites kind of cancel each other out, right? Like 5 and negative 5 equal 0. 10 and negative 10 equal 0. So 2 fifths and negative 2 fifths would equal 0. So which one of these, A, B, or C, shows that you're putting those two numbers together so that you can cancel them out? C. Because again, they're putting those opposites together. That's showing the additive inverse. Question? Okay. So on part B, I'm going to go ahead and write down what we chose for C, okay? All right. So again, the, uh, the additive inverse cancel out, so they're gone. We're left with 6 plus 5 over 2 plus 2. Let's go ahead and add up our whole numbers. 6 plus 2 gives me 8. Now let's simplify 5 over 2. How many times does 2 go into 5? 2 times. How many left over? So 5 over 2 would be 2 and a half. So if I do 8 plus 2 and a half, I end up with 10 and a half. Or 10.5 would be fine. 10.5 is acceptable. All right, any question on part A or part B? Again, I hope you're writing down not just my answers, but my little notes as well. Question? Let's move on to our next problem, number seven. So number seven says simplify. Just that word messes some people up. The reason it says simplify and not solve is because this is not an equation. Tell me, why does it not say solve here? There was a reason I called on Tommy. So do not let simplify throw you off. It just wants you to figure out what is the one final answer, okay? 
So you have multiplication and you have addition. Use your order of operations. That's one of the reasons I had those kind of problems on the uh, math review quiz. So the first thing we need to do is the multiplication. So negative 16 times a positive 1 fourth. First of all, a negative times a positive is a... I'll let you think about it. All right, so now that you had a second to think about it, a negative times a positive is a negative. So let's not worry about that anymore. We need to do 16 times 1 fourth. How do you do a whole number times a fraction? Put the whole number over 1. How do you multiply fractions? Multiply straight across. So 16 times 1, 1 times 4. Now simplify. 16 over 4 equals 4. So this is a negative 4. Now we're going to add a negative 3. So we have a negative 4 plus a negative 3. Same signs. So we're going to add the two digits. 4 and 3 give me 7 and keep the negative sign. Negative four and a negative three give you negative seven. Sophie. Any questions about this one? You guys, your, the CQA looks identical, okay? It'll be a negative whole number times a positive fraction plus a negative number, okay? So it'll be not 16, 1 fourth, and three, but it'll be almost exact. All your symbols and everything will be the same, though. So there really is no excuse not to know what to do. All right, number eight. Again, simplify. They're not using the word solve because it's not an equation. Simplify 20 plus negative 5 minus 3. So let's focus on doing 20 plus negative 5 first. A positive 20 and a negative 5 leave you with positive 15. And then you have your minus 3. 15 minus 3 is 12. There's your answer. Any questions on that one? Again, make sure you have your steps so that you can see how you got your answer. Number 9 is a two-point problem because it has two parts. So the beginning of January, temperatures began at 20 degrees Fahrenheit. They dropped three degrees each day for eight days. The temperature then rose two degrees each day for five days. Following that, they fell two degrees each day for six days. Part A, what was the temperature after the first eight days? And part B, what was the final temperature? So again, we gotta think about where did the temperature start? So it began at 20 degrees. And then after the first eight days, it says it dropped three degrees each day for eight days. So started at 20. If it dropped, is that going to be a positive or a negative? Negative. And we had something like that on the DMRs also. So dropped 3 degrees, so negative 3, for 8 days. So the smartest thing to do here would be to do negative 3 times 8, which is negative 24. So in the 8 days, it dropped a total of 24 degrees. If you start at 20 degrees and you dropped 24 degrees, now where are you? Negative 4 degrees. That is part A. So again, if you're at 20 degrees and you drop 24 degrees, now you're at negative 4 degrees. Part B wants to know what is the final temperature. So we have two more steps to do because it says the temperature then rose 2 degrees for 5 days. Let's figure out that part. So we're at negative 4 degrees. It rose, so that means positive, right? Goes up 2 degrees for 5 days. How many degrees total did it go up? 10 degrees. So if we're at negative 4, think about being at negative 4 on a number line and going to the right 10. Where are you going to be? 6 degrees now, okay? And But we have one more step. It says following that they fell 2 degrees each day for 6 days. So fell would be negative, negative two degrees each day for six days. How many total degrees did it fall? 12 degrees. So you're at six, you're at a positive six, you're going left 12, sorry, this should be a negative right here. You're going left 12, so you're going to be at, final answer, 
negative 6 degrees. So the bad part about problems like this is if you don't get part A right, it's going to be really hard to get part B right. That is a two-point question. Any questions about this one or anyone still writing down things? All right, look at number 10. Again, it has that word simplify in there. I think of all the problems on this paper, I think this is the most challenging problem. But I mean, you, you may or may not, but I think it probably is. So again, there's order of operations. We have multiplying before we need to do addition. So we're first gonna do negative 3.6 times that seven. Now again, a negative times a positive is a negative. And let's do 3.6 times 7. You cannot use a calculator on the CQA. So really, think about our math review. It's really 36 times 7. So 6 times 7 is 42. 3 times 7 is 21. Plus 4 is 25. And you have one digit that you need after the decimal. So it's going to be a negative 25.2, that first step. At least you're paying attention. All right, now... We need to add on three-fifths to this. So there's a couple options that you have. You could turn three-fifths into a decimal and then add on your decimal and then figure out which one of these, but then you'd have to change your answer back to a fraction. Or you could write negative 25.2 as a mixed number, which is what my suggestion would be. So we need to think 0.2 is going to be what as a fraction? It is not going to be two-fifths. Trust me. Not going to be two-fifths. 0 0.2 is going to be two over, 2 over 10, which simplifies to one-fifth. And if you said why, well, this is in the tenths place. Okay? So that's why it's 2 over 10. If it was in the next place over the hundredths place, it would be 2 over 100 or 2 over 1,000. So it's never going to be just over 5 because that makes it easier on you. Okay, now we have negative 25 and 1 fifth plus 3 fifths. That causes an issue also because we have a negative and a positive. When you have a negative and a positive, you're going to have to subtract them. So we really need to take away this 3 fifths from this. How do you do that with fractions? Borrow. I think that'd be the easiest thing for you guys is to borrow. So I'm borrowing one whole, so this is going to become a 24. 24 in 5 over 5. That's the same thing as 25. 24 plus 1. And if I add that 5 fifths to my 1 fifth, I get 24 in 6 over 5. What is 6 fifths minus 3 fifths? Three fifths, so it would be a negative 24 and three fifths, which is C. So again, I do think that this is the hardest problem on the on the CQA for sure. You know, the other option you have is turning the three fifths into a decimal and doing it that way. Do you want me to show you that method, and maybe you'll like it better? No. Okay. You sure? Ethan? I'm sorry. All right, so even though everyone was like, no, you're fine. Sorry, but I'm going to go ahead and show you anyway. So your other option here is when you got, when you multiplied your negative 3.6 times 7 and got your negative 25.2, you could have left it that and changed your three-fifths, three-fifths is what over ten? Six over ten, and six over ten you'd write as zero point six. So you're doing negative twenty-five point two minus zero point six. Oh, plus, sorry, because it's a plus right there. But again, one's negative and one's positive, so you're really subtracting them. Woo! 
Why won't that go away? <laughs> Crazy board. <laughs> okay. Hey, it decided to work. So it'd be a negative 24.6. And again, if you made that into a fraction, it would be the negative 24 and 3 fifths. So maybe you thought that way was harder, maybe you thought that way was easier, but you have either option, okay? All right, 11. Here we have two decimals, but notice that the first decimal is smaller than the second decimal. So how are we gonna do that? First of all, are you gonna, is your answer gonna be positive or negative? Your answer is going to be negative. If you're taking something small minus something bigger, your answer is going to be negative. Now, take your bigger decimal minus your smaller decimal. Okay? It's going to be a negative whatever the answer to this is. So 5, you got to borrow. That's going to be 7, 6, 3. A negative 3.675. So again, a smaller number minus a bigger number, you're going to end up with a negative. But then I took the absolute values of those, so I took my bigger number, my bigger digits minus my smaller digits and got that. And I know it's a negative answer to that. Like if you said 3 minus 6, it's going to be negative 3. 3 minus 6 is negative 3. Because you're really doing 6 minus 3. All right, number 12, our last one. A recipe for eight people needs the following ingredients. Jessica is gonna adjust the recipe for four people. So what is she doing to the recipe? Cutting it in half, cutting it in half. When you take half of something, what are you dividing by? You're dividing by two or you could multiply by 0.5. So you have either option. So take half. Again, you have the option of dividing by 2, or you could multiply by 0 0.5. Whichever one is going to be easier for you, okay? That's how you take half of something, though. So part A, how much flour will Jessica need if she's making it for four people? So right now, for eight people, she needs seven cups. So you could do seven divided by 2, or you could do 7 times 0 0.5. Again, whichever one's easier for you. This is 7 over 2, which is 3 and a half. 7 times 0 0.5 is 3.5. Same answer, isn't it? I'll take it either way. I'll take a fraction or I'll take a mixed number. Or hey, a decimal or a mixed number. It doesn't matter to me. Now, I think part B is a little bit harder. What's nice is part B, you don't have to get part A right to get part B right. How much sugar will be needed? Sugar, five and a half cups. Five and a half divided by two. Or you could do five and a half times 0 0.5. Again, it's going to be your choice what you think is easier. If you are dividing and you are leaving it as fractions, the first thing you need to do with this mixed number is change it into an improper fraction. Two times five is 10, plus one would be 11 over two, divided by two over one. So same change flip, 11 over 2 times 1 over 2 would be 11 over 4. 4 goes into 11 two times with 3 left over. Maybe you don't like fractions and that way is not good for you. So let's try it the other way. 5 and a half as a decimal would be 5.5 times 0 0.5. So if we think of this like we did in our DMR quiz as 55 times 5, Seven. I need two digits after my decimal, because that's what's in my question. So 2.75 would be your answer, which is the same thing as two and three-fourths. So either answer is fine. Okay. So fractions, decimals, positive and negatives. Those are some of the, like, the most important foundational building blocks that you have once you get to middle school math.